In the period between the 20s and the 60s, the National Football League grew from a niche sport to America's new obsession. From its first televised game in 1939 to its coming out party in 1958, to a standoff with the upstart AFL, to creating the very thing that would fuel it to the top, the NFL transformed itself from a meek child to a fierce warrior of the airwaves. But it would face still many more challenges, even up to today. And in part two of this two-part series, we will see how the Super Bowl era and the NFL changed television forever. And that's coming up next. Following the NFL's victory over their so-called little brothers in Super Bowl I, it appeared the road was paved for a peaceful merger with the AFL. But behind the scenes, a battle for talent, markets, and ratings was being waged between the two leagues. The disputed territory in this war was not a quarterback, running back, or even a wide receiver. It was a kicker. Pete Gogolak, who had become football's first soccer-style kicker and was poached off the Buffalo's roster by the New York Giants, violating a handshake agreement between the two leagues, a move so vile the NFL had called it an act of war. Seriously? Over a kicker? Talent supremacy was crucial between the two leagues at a time when their potential for growth was contingent on TV deal. In 1965, NBC paid the AFL $36 million to broadcast their game. There was one player that would garner not just wins for whoever landed him, but huge ratings as well. Alabama quarterback Joe Namath was selected in the first round by both the NFL and the AFL, by the Cardinals and Jets, respectively. Namath chose the bright lights of New York, and along with it came the most marketable football career since New York's Frank Gifford. Both during his career and after, Namath starred in talk shows, movies, TV shows, and endorsed products like Ovaltine, Noxima, and Hanes. Now, I don't wear pantyhose, but a beauty mist can make my legs look good. Imagine what they'll do for yours. <laughs> but Broadway Joe's most famous moment sparked the turning point in the rivalry between the NFL and the AFL. In leading his Jets to a close victory over the Oakland Raiders in which Namath tossed three touchdowns in the black hole, New York's most eligible bachelor had set a date in Super Bowl III with the Baltimore Colts, a powerhouse of the NFL that was favored by an overwhelming 18 points. Falcons head coach Norm Van Brocklin remarked that this would be Namath's first professional game. Namath, fed up with the jokes and disrespect, said the most famous nine words of the season. I got news for you, buddy. We're going to win the game, I guarantee you. That's all there was to it. Namath talked the talk, and on the field, he and the Jets walked the walk. 42 million people tuned into NBC to watch the Jets shock the Colts 16-7 in Miami. Although running back Matt Snell scored the Jets' only touchdown, it was Namath who won MVP. His index finger raised in the air as he exited the field as the AFL's great mythmaker, the David of professional football. After the Jets upset, there was no more doubting the AFL's ability to hang with their older brother. A year later, the Chiefs ran the Vikings into the ground on CBS while Jack Buck, father of Joe Buck, and Pat Summerall provided commentary. The game was somewhat forgettable, but the real action was on the sidelines where Ed Sable of NFL Films had wired up Kansas City coach Hank Stram for sound, giving audiences unforgettable quotes like, just keep a trickle the ball down the field, boys, of a necessity. The AFL had forced the hand of their mighty foe, and it was time to complete the merger. With pressure from Al Davis and other AFL owners who successfully negotiated the deal, the 1966 agreement was finalized in 1970, creating essentially an entire new NFL with new teams, new markets, and new competition. But now, among networks thirsty for the NFL's new oil. With the 1970 merger brought two distinct conferences, CBS would televise the NFC games and NBC would cover the AFC. But it was in the Sunday matchups that became must-watch TV in the fall. ABC owned one night of the week and their touchstone program was Monday Night Football. Complete with commentary from Howard Cosell and former Cowboys quarterback Don Meredith, 
Monday Night Football featured the best matchups, celebrity guests, and unforgettable moments like Earl Campbell's coming out party, Meredith's turn out the light song, and the breaking news of John Lennon's murder. An unspeakable tragedy confirmed to us by ABC News in New York City. John Lennon outside of his apartment building on the west side of New York City, the most famous perhaps of all of the Beatles, shot twice in the back. Around this same time, the networks were amassing their own on-air talent to rival the skilled players on the field. Besides the aforementioned Cosell and Meredith, the league's best former players were flocking to the booth by the 80s for prominent second careers. CBS marquee announcing team was former Giants kicker who played in the greatest game ever played and former Raiders head coach John Madden whose boisterous persona balanced the conservative play-by-play -play stylings of Pat Summerall. Oh no, there's a man down. Al Michaels, a former Reds broadcaster who called the U.S. shocking 1980 Olympic hockey victory over the Soviet Union, transitioned to football, calling games for ABC alongside Frank Gifford, another veteran of the greatest game, and former Cardinals offensive lineman Dan Deardor. For NBC, the booth was manned by Dick Enberg, whose oh my catchphrase became a staple of the AFC playoffs, and Merlin Olsen, a former part of the Rams' fearsome foursome. The battle over the airwaves still wages on to this day. More on this later. But while the NFL was steamrolling their way into the 80s, another competitor emerged. Enter the United States Football League, backed by the likes of Burt Reynolds, Donald Trump, and New Orleans businessman David Dixon. Unlike the AFL, the USFL didn't take the NFL head on, playing their games in springtime, but they were a threat to the NFL's talent pool, poaching major college athletes like Herschel Walker, Reggie White, Jim Kelly, and Steve Young. The new league's games were carried by ABC and a cable sports newcomer called ESPN, garnering slightly better ratings than the American Football League at its inception. But when the USFL challenged the NFL on its own turf the fall season, the once promising league fell apart. The NFL unmercilessly dismantled the USFL both in terms of ratings and on the business battlefield. The USFL sued them and won but they were awarded three measly dollars in an antitrust settlement, and the league folded despite getting a lucrative Sunday night broadcast offer from ESPN. It went to show the boys club of the NFL was not to be tested. ESPN got into the NFL game in 1987, broadcasting the back half of the season on Sunday nights. But it was their new highlight show hosted by Chris Berman that became the must watch event of the late night. Berman brought fast pace, colorful highlights, tinted with his signature sound effects, catchphrases, and pun-laden humor. Gino Atkins recovered the fumble, rumbling, bumbling, stumbling the fumble, rumbling, Berman was a mainstay at ESPN hosting primetime and Sunday countdown until 2017 when he took a limited role to stay with the network. By the 90s, a new competitor tossed their hat in the ring. Fox added a wrinkle to NFL broadcasts with innovative graphics like an overlaid score in the corner of the screen, additional camera angles, and of course, the football spiking robot, Cletus. The upstart network lured Pat Summerall and John Madden, still the most popular announcing team in football, and introduced newcomer Joe Buck into the fold. A new innovation sprouted in 1994 when the NFL partnered with DirecTV to create NFL Sunday Ticket, which became the first way for displaced fans to watch their favorite teams when they weren't playing national games. Invented in part by John Taffer of the TV show Bar Rescue, Sunday Ticket was originally only available commercially to bars, but soon expanded to households with DirecTV. In 1998, the NFL's very first broadcast partner became the odd man out when the NFL's television contracts were renegotiated. NBC, who broadcast their first NFL game in 1939, lost their rights with the NFL. In their place, Fox, CBS, ABC, and ESPN became the only four networks to cover the NFL. NBC carried the one and only season of the XFL in 2001, but lost that after the league's quick demise along with their NBA rights, and suffered from an NHL lockout in 2004 that wiped out an entire season. 
Meanwhile, the NFL premiered its own premium cable network, the NFL Network, in 2003. Using a complete NFL Films archives, past games, and a daily news show called NFL Total Access, NFL Network was a sign that the NFL was truly America's new pastime, becoming the first pro league to flex their muscles and create a sustainable year-round product that covered football and only football. The tonight football, this time highlighted by Al Michaels and John Madden. CBS, Fox, and NBC began alternating Super Bowls with Fox airing the classic helmet catch game and NBC getting the Steelers Cardinals shootout in back to back years. In a quest to make football more relevant and a longer news cycle, a fourth night of football was added Thursday night. The midweek game grew to be a source of controversy. The short week for players caused some to call the product unentertaining and unsafe, but ratings won out as classic games like the Browns' long-awaited victory over the Jets in 2018 that drew 8 million viewers on NFL Network, a Thursday night record. Midway through the current decade, the game and its telecast became gradually more and more accessible to viewers. The NFL began showing its Sunday morning London games on Yahoo, kicking off Sundays with 16-hour blocks of football. It also made games available on mobile, the NFL app, and Amazon Prime, catering to a new generation of cord cutters who had eschewed cable in favor of streaming apps. As all of these changes have emerged, one thing since the NFL-AFL merger has remained constant, and that is the last game of the season. The big prize, where the winners raise the sticky pewter trophy named after one of its first coaches of the big game. The Super Bowl, which started out as a humble affair between two competing leagues, is now a ratings juggernaut. However, it went through its own trials and tribulations to arrive to today. As the spectacle of crowning a king at the end of the year wore off, the league realized they had a problem. The game had gotten boring. And the more people turned off their sets, the less those multi-million dollar ad spots delivered sales. The 90s saw teams get blown out of the water like a Mr. Beast stunt. In came the salary cap of 1994, and with it brought the one thing the league secretly needed, parody. With this stock car mentality, blowouts in the big game became more of an anomaly and ad prices skyrocketed to an astonishing $5 million for a 30 second spot. Yeah, the phrase dilly dilly is worth about 800K every time dilly. they say it. Dilly dilly. Dilly dilly. Super Bowl is now a national holiday. It is the unrivaled king of television. As from its humble beginnings to now, both it and the NFL sits unchallenged atop its throne. But what can take the league down? As not only sports, but TV as a whole transitions into a different era, it raises questions to the NFL's future. Illegal streams and shared accounts hurt the NFL's revenue and give the impression that the league is losing viewers, even if it isn't. Different segments of the country have waged political warfare and threatened to stop watching based on the NFL's allowance of players to kneel for the national anthem, but also because of their alleged collusion to keep Colin Kaepernick out of the game, effectively alienating parts of both liberal and conservative America simultaneously. Fans have also been challenged by the new awareness surrounding head injuries and the mishandling of off-field incidents involving domestic violence. The future viability of football will come down to either its ability to minimize its warts or the cognitive dissonance of many of its fans. The sport still outdraws its main competitors, the NBA and MLB, by a significant margin, but for how long? The NFL toppled baseball slowly, but surely in the latter half of the 20th century will there come a day when basketball, a safer sport and more fast-paced game, will challenge football's supremacy in the American TV landscape. Time will only tell, but like all things, their reign eventually comes to an end. However, we can remember the sport's humble beginnings on television, a 1939 regular season game broadcast by NBC in New York. A crew of just a handful then, a billion dollar a year industry today. Well, I hope you enjoyed this two part series. Please leave a like, comment, and subscribe. I'm Five Points Vids, and you made it to my next video.